78 of At Your Service with Haber and Martinez. I'm Haber. That's Martinez. And we're happy to be with you today. Uh, the topic of today's show I have entitled How a Routine Traffic Stop Can Go Fatally Bad. This is one of those shows that's going to mix a real world case with real world practical advice. Plenty of pro tips. Um, we're going to talk about human nature. We're going to talk about practical realities. We're going to talk about things known and things unknown. We're going to talk about how our own unique prisms and experiences and perceptions can shape our realities and affect how other people's realities are shaped. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to show you a video that was just released last week from an incident that occurred on October 16th in Camden County, Georgia. Camden County, Georgia is just north of the Florida Georgia line. Um, and it is uh, this particular clip of video is what's called dash cam video, meaning that the, the video footage is taken from a camera that is mounted inside of the police vehicle looking forward through the front window. So the video is going to start off, and what you're going to see is, uh, the it's a deputy sheriff, you don't know that from the video, but it's a Camden County deputy sheriff who's driving on I-95, he's in the right lane, or what would be the slow lane of traffic in a marked squad car, and uh, you'll see it's 95, it's three lanes uh, in whatever direction I presume they're traveling northbound. Uh, and and what you're going to see in the video, and pardon me because I'm going to have to read off my notes. I don't want to misstate anything. But what you're going to see is you're going to see the, the police vehicle traveling in the right-hand lane, and you will see the two lanes to the left of the vehicle, the center lane and the left lane. And in the far left lane, you're going to see a light-colored uh, Dodge pickup truck uh, pass by at a very high rate of speed. There's no you know, radar on the camera that tells you how fast the car is going, but clearly you can see the car drive by quickly. Um, the, uh, the police officer initiates his uh, emergency equipment, meaning his reds and blues, and, uh, and indicates for the vehicle to pull over. He has to catch up to the vehicle because the vehicle is traveling so much faster than him at the, at the point that it passes. But he does catch up. He does get the reds and, and blues flashing and the vehicle ultimately pulls over to the right shoulder. Um, why he did not immediately pull over to the left shoulder, I can't explain, but regardless, the vehicle does pull over, uh, and it's not an inordinate amount of time. It's not like there's a, a chase going on. So the vehicle pulls over, and um, you can see the officer exit his vehicle and walk towards the subject vehicle. And you can hear him speaking. Audio is on as well. And it's very clear from the video that the officer is hot. He gets out of that car and he is uh, all business. He's not happy that this guy blew by him at a high rate of speed. So he orders the guy to exit the vehicle. In fact, he orders him to exit the vehicle several times. And ultimately, the individual does exit. He's told to uh, go to the back of his truck and place his hands on the vehicle uh, there's some non-compliance, nothing physical, but the guy's certainly not rushing to comply with the officer's uh, orders. And um, ultimately, he says to the cop, quote, I ain't doing shit. At which point the cop pulls out his taser, not a firearm, but his taser, his stun gun. And he points it at the guy and he basically tells him, you know, do what I'm telling you to do or I'm going to tase you. Um, so the guy now complies. He's got his hands on the vehicle, although he goes through some kind of a strange ballet kind of pirouette thing in, in doing it, which is a little bit uh, uh, bizarre, but you can judge that for yourself and assign any meaning or insignificance to it as you may wish. So uh, at this point, now the individual has his hands on the back of the vehicle and he asks for the basis uh, of the traffic stop, you know, why are you stopping me? And the officer tells him that you, you passed, you passed me doing a hundred miles an hour. He continues to order the guy to keep his hands there. The guy's not complying. And then he tases him. So the taser discharges. Now the guy's shot, not shot, but the prongs of the taser are in his chest. And again, you'll judge for yourself what you, what you see and how you choose to interpret it. As it appears to me, uh, the individual lunges at the officer at this point in time. Um, there's some flailing with the arms. Uh, he grabs the police officer 
And he is now, it appears that he is pushing the officer into the lane of traffic. Because remember, they're on the right shoulder. So he's being pushed towards traffic. And there's an absolute physical struggle going on at this point. The officer's trying to push back, not to, to get into traffic. I don't know if the individual's intent is to push him into traffic. I, I, I can't explain it because I'm not in the guy's head. I'm only reporting what I saw and what you will see. So at this point, both of them now wind up with their hands basically on each other's necks. And the officer is able to get his, uh, his, his baton or collapsible ass out. And he uses it uh, to, to force the guy's head back. He strikes him with it. And he's pushing the guy backwards. Um, and ultimately, uh, the guy releases his grip and says to the cop, yeah, bitch. At which point, the two of them tumble down in between the two vehicles. So now they're both on the ground, so you can't really see what's going on on the ground, but it's very quick. It's a matter of seconds. You hear a quick pop. The officer gets up. He's now got his handgun in his hand, and the individual is laying on the ground shot. I think he shoots them. That's why they go down. I think you get, he shoots them when they're standing up, but, but we'll see. Okay, we'll see. You'll see for yourself. That's how I saw it. I could be wrong. Yeah, um, he were, uh, that's what got. That's when he gets to that. That's why it's so short on the ground because he's already shot. That's why he fell to the 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 the, the traffic stop. He falls to the ground. And the cop falls on top of him, but then he gets up immediately because the guy's shot. Got it. Okay. So either way, the sequence of events is as pretty much as I've stated. But like I said from the beginning, I don't want to uh, taint what you see or you interpret. Remember, I told you one of the things about today's show is talking about perception. Each of us are unique individuals. Ed and I can be standing on opposite street corners and observe the very same traffic crash or the very same robbery. And both of us could give very different descriptions of what we saw just based on the different prisms from which we saw it. Doesn't necessarily mean one of us is lying or covering up or trying to help anyone or hinder an investigation. It's just a reality of the human condition. We all have perceptions. And they're shaped by who we are and our own life experiences and the, the given variables in the moment that are going on that affect the way we see things. For example, if Ed and I, as I just gave that example, if one of us is the victim of an armed robbery, we may react very differently than some third party who's watching it from 30 feet away and is not being threatened with a weapon. The dynamic of actually being in mortal peril and perceiving that can certainly affect the way that you perceive that incident as opposed to a, a third-party bystander who is not under that same type of duress. So uh, with that said, let me go ahead and have our producers play the video. I'm going to ask you guys just to kind of pay attention because I, I may want you to stop it at certain points just so we can highlight certain things. And then after we get to the point of the shooting, I'm going to allow the video to keep rolling. It's, it's about 20 minutes long, but we'll kill the volume because there's really not much to discuss about the conversations that occur after the, the shooting is complete and the other officers and paramedics respond to the scene. All right. With that said, uh, Ed, do you want to add anything before we start the video? I'll show the video. Okay. Do it to it. So that's, that's the, the officer's, officer's vehicle, vehicle in the right, in the right lane, lane of traffic. Of traffic. Keep, Keep watching, watching the, the left, left and you'll, and you'll see, see the, the truck. truck. He immediately, he immediately pulls, pulls to, the to the left because he, he knows he's going to pull this guy, guy over, over for speeding. speeding. You see the lights, the lights are on, on now. You see the, the reds and blues flashing. flashing. Now, now, arguably, arguably this, this gentleman, gentleman could have pulled, pulled over, over to the left, left. <clears throat> but for, for some, some reason he wants to pull over to the right. right. I don't I think, think that's a very, very big, big deal. deal. He, he actually, actually does, does pull over. over. He's, He's got, got his, his blinker, blinker on. on. Just, Just as, as a pro tip, tip if you ever find, find yourself in this position, position pull over to the left. Don't do what this guy is doing.
could have pulled over there, Mike. Could pulled over back. I mean, yeah, I, I, I understand why the cop was a little hot getting out of the car, but all right, the volume's going to come on. So let's not talk. Audio's going to come on now. Sheriff's office. My name is Halloween. I don't care. Step to the rear of this vehicle. In the name of who? In the name of the law of the state of Georgia. Step back here. Now you're getting tased. I'm going. Watch me now. Put your hands on the back of that truck. Do you see that? Put your hands on the back of that truck. The back of the truck. Both hands. Turn around. 34, can you send me another unit? One non compliant. Your name is Officer Who? Staff Sergeant Aldridge with the Camden County Sheriff's Office. Who County? Camden County. Put your hand behind your back. Do I have a do I have a warrant? Wait, wait, no, 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 no. Excuse me. Excuse me. Either put your hands behind your back or you're getting tased. I'm telling you that right Why? now. Why am I getting tased? Because you are under arrest for speeding and reckless driving. I'm not driving. Nobody was hurt. How was I speeding? You passed me doing 100 miles an hour. Okay, so that's a speeding ticket, right? Sir, tickets in the state of Georgia are criminal offenses. I don't have a ticket in Georgia. You do now? Why? You passed me doing 100 okay, miles an hour. And what? Am I going Hands to jail? behind your back. Yes, you are going no. to jail. Hands behind your back. Put your hands behind your back. Yeah, bitch. Yeah, bitch. Stay down. Stay down. Stay down. Camden, shots fired! Shots fired, Camden! Stay down! Do not get up! Stay down! Stay down! Stay down! Camden, shots fired! Suspect down! Can you send me help? All right, go ahead and pause it for us, would you? Pause the video. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. So, so there's an awful lot to unpack with what we just saw there. Um, an awful lot to unpack. Uh, this is about as bad as it gets. I can't stress enough how everybody here has some fault. Um, there's enough, there's blame to go around on both sides here. Uh, but this is as classic as an example as I can think of or ever show up for everything that could possibly go wrong at a traffic encounter to go wrong. Ed? I agree. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know, Mike, I don't know if I would go as far as to say everybody has fault. I think the officer definitely should have handled this from the very start much differently. Um, yes. That's well, there's, there's fault on his end. Right. There's no reason to be yelling and screaming at people for a traffic infraction, even if in Georgia speeding at that excessive uh, speed is a criminal offense, so, which they can arrest you. Let me, let me just, means. let me just throw this in. So the audience understands that first of all, I, I did check by the letter of the law in the state of Georgia. Speeding is an arrestable offense regardless of the speed. Really? Go ahead. Challenge me if you'd like, but go to Mr. Google and that's the answer you're going to get. Speeding 
is technically a crime. Now, even though it is a crime, it can be handled at the officer's discretion as an infraction. So they can give you a ticket. That's a basic infraction. Or they can give you a ticket that's a, what we call a PTA or an NTA, which is a paper arrest for a misdemeanor where they don't book you into jail and it's just a promise to appear. Or it can go to the opposite extreme and they can take you into custody for speeding in Georgia. Period. Which, by the way, that's the law. Which, by the way, as an analogy, in Florida, a drive, driving while license suspended is the same situation. With knowledge. Florida. Right, with knowledge. It's a, it's an arrestable offense, but if you do it, if you if you get stopped by a police officer, generally speaking, during the day, and you're polite, they don't arrest you. If you get stopped by a police officer after let's say ten or eleven o'clock at night, you might get arrested. And I can guarantee you that if you're a jerk, you're going to get arrested. So let's start with that little premise right there and, and give out a pro tip. No matter what happens in a traffic scenario and again this is just no felonies involved no you know duis involved just basic traffic stops police officers have an awful lot of discretion and that means based on their mood and purely their subjective state of mind they can lawfully decide whether or not to, they don't have to give you a speeding ticket here in florida they can give you a written warning or they could just give you a verbal warning and send you on your way or not only could they give you a speeding ticket but they can write you up for a safety belt violation and anything else they might come up with. In other words, if they really want to be dicks, they can be dicks. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about, the concepts that I call being held in, quote, contempt of cop or uh, picking up what I call gratuitous charges. And, and when that happens, it's, it can be just because the cop is a dick. All right, let's let's be honest. There are some cops that have a chip on their shoulder and they're just dicks. But I would say that is the, the vast minority. Most police officers are going to treat you the same way you treat them, as will most people in any walk of life. If you're pleasant and polite, if you're respectful and not challenging, they're generally going to tend to be kinder and more understanding and compassionate than if you get out like this guy did. Yep. Who are you? What's your authority? You know, he, the first thing he did was to challenge... The first thing he said that was a problem was, I'm not doing shit. That's a problem. But I just want to go back a second, Mike. I, I disagree with you slightly. Most cops, not only do they treat you the way you treat them, there's a lot of cops that, as a credit to their profession, even when you start being a dick, they can still stay composed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Again, most. I agree. Most the vast majority of the time, you're going to wind up without a problem. But when you escalate, you know, it's going to get escalated more. It's, it's like the, the Sean Conray line. I think we've talked about that from the untouchables, right? They send one of yours to the hospital. You send two of theirs to the morgue. That's the so, Chicago way. Right. That's what's going to, that's, that's the reality of what's going to happen when you go at the cop, as we saw here. What are you prepared to do? <laughs> so, you know, this is where this is where we begin with this sequence of events, right? You've got a non-compliant guy who's challenging the officer's authority from the get-go. And to the cop who's already heated, and, and again, I'm going to go back and double down and say, if I'm reviewing this as an internal affairs or as a prosecutor and figuring out whether or not this cop should be charged with anything here... I'm not going to be happy about how he exited his police vehicle. I don't care. I don't care if this guy was going 100 miles an hour. First off, I didn't see him endangering any other traffic. I saw him speeding. I saw him using a blinker. I'll tell you what would have pissed me off more than anything is the fact that he didn't shut his blinker off when he pulled over to the roadside. I would have shot that thing out. That's why I'm not a cop with a badge and a gun. So, but, well, but again, but, but he didn't do anything that you could charge him with. He was just. Well, he, uh, in Georgia, he did. He could be arrested no, just for cop, speeding. The cop, the cop. No, 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 no. But, but again, I'm looking at it just from the perspective of as as hindsight in right. investigating the investigator. I, I would, I'm saying this guy might have come out of the car with a different attitude if instead of the officer, you know, shrieking like a banshee to get out of the car, he had approached him a little more rationally. And I'll say something else about that that bothers me. 
If that officer had some fear for his safety, which I'm sure is going to be his ultimate argument, he sure as hell didn't show it because he didn't have a gun out or a taser out or his hand on either when he approached the vehicle. No, I don't all think he had fear. He didn't have a fear when he approached. All he was doing was yelling. He was pissed I think, off. I think it's a teachable moment for the officer. Yes. Obviously. I mean, at, least at this point, it's a little late. I think he definitely learned his lesson. Um, but I think it would have definitely been a teachable moment for him. And it's a it's a it's a situation where you 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 teach him that look, like I tell my clients, and this is one of the things that, that I preach to my clients when they hire me, because if you know a lot of you guys when you get arrested or whatever, and you hire a lawyer, or even for a civil case, you want your lawyer to be a fighter. I want my my lawyer is a fighter. Listen, there is always time to fight. There's always time to fight. You don't want to be the initiator as a lawyer. You don't want to go in fighting with the prosecutor. Because you can get a lot more honey with, with, you know, what is it? A lot more bees with honey than with vinegar. Plus, there's always time to fight. So this is one of those moments where you could tell the cop, listen, I understand. I'll tell you what bothered me, which is I think what bothered him. He starts to move over, and then he goes back into the left. When he could have clearly gone over and gone off the shoulder, he decided not to. Went back to the left, all the way to the left lane, then drove a little bit more. Then went. So I think the cop was thinking, this guy's playing games. It's possible, but you're the you're the Again, there's time. You're the adult in the room. Just relax. He pulled over already. I agree. It's a big deal. Just go well, like I said, I think I think the cop came out of this way too hot. He started this, and 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 Michael. as it turns out, more information that I'm going to provide to the audience in a moment, you will understand possibly why the subject was so triggered by the cops' right behavior. Yeah. So, <laughs> right, because remember, look, none of us know who we're dealing with. In, in, in random encounters. If I bump into some guy on the street, I have no idea if he suffers from, you know, some bone condition where if I accidentally push him or shove him and a normal person would be fine, he loses his balance and cracks his head open and drops dead of an embolism. Or, or, a, or a mental disorder, which I suspect this guy has something as well. But I'll say the other thing that I think is, is, is a teachable moment for the officer. Not only were his words... Uh, uh, that escalated the situation. If you notice, he had his taser out immediately. Immediately. He didn't pull his taser out until after the guy got out of the car and did not go to the back. That's when he oh, pulled the oh, taser out. Look at it again. He had it out. Oh, he had it in his hand. He had it in his hand. He pulls it out almost immediately. Right after the guy says, I'm not doing shit. He pulls right, out. Right, but it's after the guy's already out of the car. He doesn't yeah, walk yeah, up to the car with the taser. He's not at the back of the car yet. Right, right, right. right. The car yet. The minute he says, I'm not doing shit, he pulls right. his taser out. Yes. Well, he knew he was dealing with a guy who was challenging him. And then Who are you? What law? What authority? And that probably, and, and when you tell the audience why it's possible, that it's understandable. Yeah, well, we're going to get, let me, let me, let me give issues with law enforcement. Let me give them that now. So what the, would have gotten there had he been a little, the officer that is, just wait, wait a little bit. Let's see what's going to happen. You know, if they could have had a rational discussion without the hyperbole, without the ag aggravation, if this guy, and who knows how he would have reacted even if the officer didn't do that. Right. I don't know. But I I'm just assuming a best case scenario that the officer approaches in a calm, cool, collected fashion, and this guy and he have a dialogue, he might have been walked out of this thing based on his circumstances, which right. obviously the cop doesn't know. So who is this subject that was, that was shot and killed? So, um, as it turns out, this individual was arrested uh, here in, in Florida. In 2004, he was charged with the armed robbery of a, a Walgreens in Broward County, Florida. He was convicted of that crime, and he was sentenced to life in prison. He served 16 years of that sentence. And in 2020, a group called the Innocence Project, who you may or may not have heard of, we'll talk about a little more about them in a minute, uh, got a, got wind of this case, did some homework, and were able to come up with uh, newly discovered evidence that was thoroughly exculpatory and supported the alibi defense that this guy put forth at trial, but for which he had no evidence to support his alibi. And now the evidence was plain as day. In fact, it was so plain that in 2020, when it was presented to the Broward State Attorney's Office, they voluntarily agreed to vacate the conviction. They stood up and said, we're sorry. And not only did they do it, but the Florida legislature authorized 
And Governor DeSantis signed a, I don't want to get the number wrong. We'll keep looking for $817,000 payment to him as compensation for the time that he spent in custody. And a formal apology from the state of Florida signed by the governor. So, I mean, this guy was truly railroaded. He did not commit that robbery. As far as I know, he has no other prior criminal history. Well, uh, we don't know, but I will say this. We don't know, and it's very, very possible that for a burglar, was it an armed burglary? It was an armed robbery. Very Well, uh, uh, maybe shots were fired. I was going to say the fact that he got life, Michael, but maybe somebody was shot, and that I, would I be don't, life. I don't, so, I don't know. I don't know, but it doesn't really matter. The, right. the point really, is... The it point is, matter. this guy spent 16 years in prison and suffered, you know, obviously both physically and mentally uh, significant damage. And he was right. injured, according to his family. And, and I'm going to give you some quotes. Um, it was eight hundred and seventeen thousand uh, dollars. His brother is quoted as saying, quote, I believe there were possibly some issues going on some mental issues with my brother. I know him quite well. The officer just triggered him, undoubtedly triggered him. It was excitement met with excitement. Correct. And then the defendant's mother is quoted as saying that her son, the deceased son, lived in constant fear of being arrested and incarcerated again. So let's just assume that all of that is true and based on what we know about this this 53-year-old man, um, he was abused by the system, okay? And I don't know why he was convicted. Obviously, you and I had nothing to do with that case. We haven't studied it. We haven't read transcripts. We're only operating on the limited information that we have. But, I mean, imagine being falsely accused, legitimately falsely accused, and, and convicted and sent to prison and spending 16 years there and losing, you know, that huge portion of your life um, that that's going to affect you profoundly. And it's certainly going to affect the way that you look at law enforcement, even if you don't necessarily hold the cops responsible. I don't, I mean, I would assume again, I don't know anything about the, the Walgreens robbery, but let's just assume that the police didn't see it. They weren't there. They're not witnesses. So all they did was piece together we their probable know. cause. Hand but we don't know, Michael, maybe one of the cops lied and that's why he's so triggered. I mean, put yourself in his place. I'm not saying what he did was right, because I still think what he did was absolutely wrong. And I think he left this officer no choice. And I'll get to that later, why I think he really did leave this officer no choice. <clears throat> um, but I also understand, can you imagine, he's he's probably from Florida. So when this cop tells him, I'm arresting you for speeding, his mind gets triggered thinking, shit, here we go again. You can't arrest me for speeding. So. So the backstory is he doesn't realize in Georgia you can. The the backstory is that he does live in Georgia now. He lives close to Atlanta, or at least he was at the time of the incident. And he had been in Florida visiting his mom. He was driving back from Florida to his home near Atlanta. And he had just crossed the Florida state line. So he may or may not have been aware of the Georgia law. I, I don't know that that was really. A, a big focal point in this thing, although I suspect well, that I disagree with you because I think with with his history, if he doesn't realize that in Georgia you can get arrested for speeding and he thinks that's complete and utter crap, he might be thinking, here we go again. This cop is just making stuff up. He's just going to arrest. Well, me. that's clearly that's clearly what the family indicated. And I'm going to go ahead and give him the benefit of the doubt and say that that's exactly what was going on. But but. But, you know, you got to put yourself in the officer's place, too. The officer was a bit aggressive. I get it. But when you turn around and you get physical with a police officer on the side of the road, nothing good is going to come of that. I can guarantee you nothing good is going to come of that at all for anybody. Now, this 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 was a. I have another observation about the officer, not really the officer, the, 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 the sheriff's department policy, I suppose, had that been a two man unit and he yeah. wasn't the only cop in that car, this thing would have ended differently. That guy would probably be alive right now. He might've taken a beating, 
but he'd be alive. Right. I because agree. it was one officer and he had no backup. And I'll tell you that, look, there were a lot of mistakes by the decedent and I feel very bad for him. Nobody should have to, to die like that. And especially if, if, if he really was suffering from post-traumatic stress or any other type of mental illness or what have you. And I, and I truly believe that that was the case here, but you can't go at it with a cop on the roadside and when I'm looking at the video and I'm seeing this guy lunge at the cop and start forcing him towards oncoming traffic on I-95, that's now life and death for the officer, right? So he's now obviously going to have to put his life above anything else. And he's and already, the, t- and he's in, already in, tased the guy, by the way. In fairness to him, well, yeah, before I get to what's in fairness to the officer, the other thing the officer's thinking is, I just tased this guy, and it's not doing anything. You can hear he tases him in the back, and the guy gets stiff and then turns around, and when he's doing this with his hands, what he's doing is he's grabbing the wires. That's what he was doing. He's grabbing the wires on the on the taser, and he gets closer to him, and this cop is thinking, okay, th- this guy must be on something. I know that's probably what went through his head. What the hell is this guy on? How is this taser not, not affecting him? But what I wanted to say in fairness to the officer, if you keep listening, and I don't know if you have this in your notes, apparently the officer's vision is so poor that without his glasses, he can't see at all. Right. That's towards the end of the video. He says that apparently when his glasses, what really freaked him out, what scared the officer was once he can't see. And I can tell you, look, my daughter's vision is very bad. And my daughter will tell you without her glasses, it's scary because you can't see anything. And so he's now in a life and death struggle with a guy that he's thinking is, is on drugs or something. This guy's not normal. The guy then grabs him by the necks and says, well, now, bitch, which seems like well, he's, he says it a couple times. And he's choking him. He's choking him. May have even been trying to, you know, gouge his eyes out because up around his face. This this cop got scared, rightfully so. He can't see. He can't see what this guy's doing with his hands. So he shot him and he shot him standing up. You, you can kind of, I think the, I think the shot is so loud that it, it cuts out, it distorts the microphone and it cuts out, but he shoots them when they're standing up in the stomach and that's when they both fall. And then again, maybe, maybe it shouldn't matter or what, but later on when the scene is secure and the paramedics are trying to save his life, this officer starts crying. I don't know if you heard that. I don't know how long you lost sight. But yeah. he, starts, he starts crying because he really didn't want to kill this guy. So I do believe that he thought he had no choice but to kill this guy. I'm not saying that I would have thought that in that situation. However, Michael, put it in that situation, I might have thought the same thing. Put it this way. Imagine if you're in that situation, because you and I have eyesight, we can see without our glasses. Imagine if somebody sprays you with pepper spray as some guy's trying to choke you out on the side of the road. And they hit your eyes with pepper spray. Now you're blind. What are you going to do, Mike? Yeah, you gonna- it's, I, I agree. You're 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 in, you're you're severely compromised. You're in fight or flight. You got to do anything you can to save yourself. You can't even use the baton because you can't see what the hell you're going to hit. So, I, I think the overarching for me, the, the the one lesson I would like to impart to the audience is, when you're on the side of the road, and Michael has said this, I don't know how many times, you're not going to win that argument. When the cop says you're speeding on the side of the road, you're speeding. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. He's judge and jury on the side of the road. You can't sit there and fight with him. You can't say. And then he says, I wasn't driving. Dude, you were literally driving. (laughs) You were literally driving the car. Then he corrects himself and says, well, I didn't bother anybody. I didn't hit it. The the cop is not going to argue with you. So you got to think but, but he had he had already made up the officer clearly had already made up his mind. Um, and, and listen, for all we know, again, like the officer didn't know about this individual's prior history. Had he known that he may have dealt with this differently. Who knows? Maybe he would have been more compassionate or under- I he would have. He I, I don't know how that might have. Maybe yes, maybe no. But at the same time, this guy doesn't know the officer's situation, right? Maybe the officer's three-year-old daughter was run over by somebody who was speeding in his neighborhood. And so he's got a particular pension for speeders. 
again, you know, nobody, these are the, the parts of the human condition that we don't necessarily consider or account for in our everyday, uh, you know, interactions with people. You're sitting at the deli counter at Publix. You don't know what the person next to you has been through in their life. And so, you know, maybe they say or do something that, that is seemingly crazy, but there may be a, a basis for it, right? right? I mean, you could take, for example, I don't know if you saw that, the, the, the movie, The Wrestler, the Mickey Rourke movie. Uh, I saw it once. So, so there was a scene in that movie where he gets a part-time job working at the deli counter in a, in a, in a, rest, in a, in a supermarket. And, and, you know, they start hounding him and they realize he's the wrestling guy and he just, he's traumatized, man. The guy loses his mind and he winds up slicing his finger on the thing and throwing blood at people. I mean, he just lost it. So my, my point is we all have triggers and, and, and any of us can be triggered. You know, some of us are, are in better control of those, uh, you know, stimuli than others. But the truth is, Anybody can be triggered at some point, right? Like the expression, everyone's got a price. Everybody's got a trigger point. Yep. And, and for some people, it's a hair trigger. For other people, it's, you know, a hammer trigger. But, but here's another observation I want to make in general. And now I understand this guy, why well, he may have done that. But we see so many videos, Michael. And I don't know about you, we have clients. I don't do a lot of traffic tickets, but I do some for friends and whatnot. We see so many people that get out of the car or in their car and speak to, to these officers extremely disrespectfully. Now, look, I, I can, I can be honest on this podcast and tell you that I have, I have laid into a few cops. Oh, I've definitely laid into a few of them pretty bad, pretty, pretty bad. The reason nothing ever happened to me is I never, I have never, not once have I ever been disrespectful to an officer until he said something to me, the, the few instances where one of them called me an asshole because I told him, would you stop before? He said, oh, you know, whatever. And I said, no, I did. He says, yes, you did. And, and all I said was, all right, here, just go give me the ticket. We'll deal with it in court. That's all I said. And he says, you don't have to be an asshole. He knew, and I don't, and, and I know what to say when I, when I yelled at him and I got out of the car to yell at him, first words I said out of his mouth, I said, did you just call me an asshole? You're disrespecting me over a traffic ticket. So I laid the groundwork where he knows he better not escalate this because when it gets to internal affairs, they're going to see he called me an asshole over a traffic ticket. You know, and truth is a defense. Exactly. So I wouldn't suggest anybody do the things that I've done with the handful of officers that I've done this with. I think it's only happened two or three times, but I've never gotten to that point. I've never said I'm not doing shit. I've never turned and faced an officer and attacked him. Never. Never. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious that, you know, I mean, I don't think you need to, to be a rocket scientist, although there are some people out there, I'm sure, who are going to say that that's a perfectly le legitimate exercise of self-defense. No, are you crazy? And they'd be, and they'd be 100 percent yeah. 100 wrong. You're 100 so, percent wrong. So we've discussed the nature of police citizen encounters, you know, again and again and again. You get pulled over. You get confronted by a police officer. If it is a consensual encounter, if they just walk up to you in a public place and say, do you mind if we talk? You have every right to say, eh, no, nah, not so much. Not interested. Thank you. Have a nice day. And, and if I may add, I would suggest you don't talk to them because if, if the only, there's only two ways it could go. And one of them is not going to go well, could end up like this. No, seriously. One of them could end up like this. So if you don't have to talk to them, why even bother with the 50-50 chance? So, whatever. The, the point is... It's very polite to say, am I in custody? No. Well, then, officer, respectfully, I choose not to speak to you. I got to go. And that's the, it. The difference maker is whether or not you're in custody. And that's what distinguishes an encounter from a detention, right? From a detention, you you can't leave. And a traffic stop is a detention. That is a seizure under the Fourth Amendment, the government is exercising its authority over a citizen to detain you against your will okay now it's a temporary detention as a general rule unless it becomes something more as it did here so again let's just assume a perfect world you get you blow by that trooper i mean i don't know if it happens to everybody, but it has happened to me where I wasn't paying attention and I was hauling ass in the left lane. And all of a sudden I, I noticed the guy on the right of me that I just blew by and I don't want to hit the brakes because I don't want to light myself up. 
but I immediately take my foot off the gas and start praying. That's when I get religion, right? Because you, it, it's just a brainless move. I should have seen him as I was approaching and, and not done it. So, but if you do and the guy lights me up, I'm going to pull over immediately. If I'm in the left lane and there's a left shoulder, guess what? I'm pulling over on the left shoulder. Why? Because it's faster. It's less opportunity for this guy to be thinking, what am I doing? Why am I not pulling over? Why am I hiding something in the car? Do I have some nefarious purpose? You know, who knows what's going through the mind of a police officer in those seconds or moments. Well, I, but I, I do know that the shorter the duration, the less time that I make him think, the more uh, cooperative I am, so to speak, respectful I am in my deeds and behavior by responding to his display of authority, the better that's likely to work out for me in the end, right? So the first thing is here, that's number one. You get pulled over, stop. Number two, don't challenge the cop, okay? It's not a matter of what you did right or wrong. It's not a matter of pleading or proving your case. It's not a matter of establishing innocence or non-guilt at that point in time. It's a matter of getting out of there on your own two feet or behind the wheel of your own vehicle. So the, the point that I would make on that is there is a time and a place to levy the fight against the allegation. That time is not on the roadside, uh, is, is not in those moments. That place is not on the roadside. And the person is not you person to do it is your lawyer. So that takes me to one of the uh, Haber PA uh, uh, taglines that I like to use called the, the convergence of the three wrongs, right? And this can happen, the three wrongs, right? This can happen at anybody, to anybody at any place at any time. It's coming into, the, coming into contact with the wrong cop in the wrong place under the wrong circumstances. That's it. And it could be because you did something wrong. It could be because you did nothing wrong and you just happened to be in the wrong place. It could be because you're with the wrong people. It could be because it's just the wrong cop and he's in a pissed off mood and decided I'm getting someone and you're the guy, you're getting it tonight. Whatever. If those three wrongs conspire and you're caught in them, you need to be very careful of being held in contempt of cop and picking up gratuitous charges. Gratuitous charges, who knows what else. I just want to share my own unofficial um, survey with my own personal experiences with law enforcement. Michael, I have been pulled over by cops, obviously, for doing things and traffic infractions. Some of them were pretty bad. I got to be honest with you. One of them was, I, I don't even know what the hell I was thinking. I mean, I know what I was thinking. I, I was younger. I was single. I was out on a date. I had the Porsche, I was at a traffic light on 8th Street around 2 o'clock in the morning, and I decided to show my date, who was like, how fast is this car? <laughs> Just how fast it really is, not realizing that there was a vehicle behind me, but behind that vehicle were two patrol cars, right? And as an example, I've done this several times. I'm going to tell you what happened. I took off, I peeled out, I was gone. And when I looked up in the, in the rearview mirror and I was already in third gear, those cars looked like matchboxes. They were little tiny cars with lights and sirens, two of them, coming down 8th Street after me. I was so far in front of them, Michael, I was able to pull into a side street, pull up far enough because I realized both of them needed to get in, put the car in neutral because it was manual, put on the emergency brake, take off my seatbelt, pull out my wallet, get my license, and they still hadn't turned in behind me reach in the glove box to get my insurance and my registration. So you're ready. When the officer, I had, I had him like this out the window. He came to the window with an attitude. He was like, what the hell is wrong with you? You know what I'm stopping you for? And the only thing I said to him is, oh, I know exactly what you're stopping for. There's at least three or four citations you could give me. I'm sorry, officer. That's all I can say. I'm sorry. But the girl I was with was like, what are we going to tell him? I'm like, what do you mean? What am I going to tell him? What? What? You, you ruptured your appendix. I'm rushing you to the hospital. There's nothing I can tell him. I screwed up. Went to his car. Obviously, he ran me to make sure I had a license and I wasn't suspended. And he came. This is at 2 o'clock in the morning, which, Michael, you know, late at night, they like to arrest you. Um, and, and, and as fast as I was going, he probably could have arrested me for reckless. Probably. I'm not, I'm not saying it would have stuck, but he would have had a good faith basis for it. Came back to the car. 
gave me my information, and you know what he told me? These exact words. I'm going to let you go because I like your car, but I like your attitude even better. Now, do me a favor. Slow down. I, I, I was a, a passenger in a vehicle in a very similar situation with a state trooper. It, you know, again, your attitude and your behavior has yeah. a profound effect upon the attitude and the behavior of other people. But there's a caveat, right? So I would say in those situations, at least 70 to 80 percent of the time, I've, I, I've, I've actually not been given a ticket. But there have been times where the officer says, okay, thank you. He comes back and he says, okay, so, sir, here's your citation for speeding and your driver's license. And I'm like, okay, thank you very much. And then when I go to court, he either doesn't show up or he has always said, judge, you know what? We'll dismiss it. He was a gentleman. He was very polite. Let's just dismiss it. So fighting with them on the side of the road, I can guarantee you nothing good comes of it. You're going to either get the ticket and they're going to make sure that they show up to court to crucify you, or you're going to get shot and killed over a speeding ticket. Over well, a speeding ticket. These are the perils associated with what would, would ordinarily be called a routine traffic stop. And why? Because there is no such thing as routine when you're in law enforcement, because you never know who's going to get out of that vehicle or what they're going to do. We all want to believe in the best of people, Unfortunately, they see the worst in people. And because they see the worst in people, they have to expect that. Now, again, this cop, this deputy sheriff, this staff sergeant, in my estimation, should have, could have, and, 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 and would have had a much better ending had he comported himself better. And more fundamentally, as I said, if this were a two-man unit, that guy would not be dead right now. I, would, I, I, I will stake anything on that. Yeah. Because there would have been another officer there to contain the situation. It wouldn't have gone that far. I'm not saying that this guy might not have taken a beating. If he did what he did with two cops there, he probably would have. But he'd be alive. Um, you know, and, and it would all get hashed out later. Um, so where are we now? Uh, I want to talk about... I don't know why you're... Well, we, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. But I want to talk about what to do and what not to do when you have an apparently overreacting or aggressive police officer. Correct. Right. So when when you're that guy who gets pulled over and that cop gets out of the car like that and that's what you have coming at you, you need to know in your own mind that you are dealing with a guy who's unfucking hinged. OK, I I'm sorry, but that is unhinged. It's unprofessional. It is uncool. It is unacceptable. But you need to have peace of mind to know that if you go at somebody who's unhinged, things are going to go really bad. And by the way, the unhinged guy is the one with the gun right. and the taser and the baton. So and back you, up. You need to oh. you need you need to do two things. Number 1, if you think that you're being mistreated by a cop or let's take it even further. Let's say that you get pulled over by one of these unmarked vehicles, which there are a million of now, right? So there's some Dodge Charger or a Ford pickup that's got no police insignia on it, but it's got strobes, right? Reds and blues. You don't have to stop for that car, but what you do need to do is acknowledge it. Dial 911 on your cell phone. That call is being recorded in real time. Hello, 911. Uh, my name is Mike Haber. I'm driving a white Cadillac SUV. I'm on I-95 at 95th Street northbound. There's a vehicle behind me. It's got red and blue lights. It's not a marked police unit. I don't want to stop. I'm afraid. I need to know whether or not this is an actual police car. Believe me, they're going to tell you. Or if it's beyond that, now let's say you're this guy, right? And this cop is, is coming up to your side and he's screaming bloody murder. So you know what's coming. You know the guy's a lunatic. Dial 911. Lock your door. Put your window up. 911, there's a police officer coming. He's out of his mind. He's screaming. He's shouting. I'm scared to death. Please send another officer here, right? Because at least you're preserving the fact of what your perception is. So that excited utterance, that spontaneous statement, that is your state of mind in the moment. And, and if you're rational and you're making those types of intelligent decisions, that's going to play very well in a courtroom later. Now, this guy may be getting more incensed by the nanosecond because you're on the phone, but you can say to him, I'm on with 911. And you yep. can show him the phone, 911, and say, 
when they send another cop here, I'm getting out of the car and not before. Yeah, I just want to make sure you're real. I just want to make sure you're a real cop. Most cops will understand. because I have a, You know, I have another scenario that was very similar to this. Now that you're talking about that. South, it was in South Miami. And I had a, two taillights that were busted in my pickup truck. I didn't know. And I pulled into a parking garage. And the officer comes up behind me. Michael, you would have thought, I don't know, that I had killed, I had killed John Wick's puppy. I mean, he was ready to he was ready to shoot me right then and there. He started screaming at me, screaming, you know what you did, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, and I really didn't know because I didn't know my taillights were out. Plus, I had turned into the parking garage of um, right there on Sunset Place where the CVS used to be. And apparently you couldn't turn into that CVS going, I guess, northbound on US-1. You could only turn into it coming southbound on that street. Anyway. He says, and you and you turned illegally. So I'm like, illegal? What did I illegal? I pulled into a parking lot. And I but I didn't say it to him like that. I just said, illegal what what illegal turn? I, I pulled into a parking lot. I'm confused. And he started yelling and screaming at me. But here's here's I'm pointing this out because I'm gonna tell you what I said, but it almost got it, I mean, it did get escalated, not to this. But when he starts yelling at me, I said, look, I already have my stuff in my hand because I like to do that so they see I'm not going to be combative. And I said, look, I'm not going to fight with you, man. I don't know what you're talking about. Here, just give me a ticket. And he just stayed there staring at me like Michael Myers, like like a lunatic cop in uniform. So I looked at him. I said, dude, what is your problem? And then he, he I told him, just get out of here. The next thing I know, four South Miami patrol cars show up. They're talking, and then they come over with a canine sergeant, and he tells me to yells at me to get out of my car. I'm like, what the hell is going on? When I get out of the car, you know what he told me? Did you tell this officer he was going to have a problem with you? Like, in his mind, I have no doubt. He heard me say, you're going to have a problem with me. I swear to you, Michael, I did not say that. I said, what is your problem? But I should have, in hindsight, I should have just stayed quiet and said, look, Officer, I don't know what you're talking about. I apologize. Just just give me the tickets and we'll deal with this in court. Because even that little <clears throat> statement, somehow he heard something. Triggered, it triggered him. Triggered him. And it's a miracle. The so, only reason, listen, the only reason I wasn't arrested and the only reason I probably wasn't shot, because it turns out that the sergeant that showed up used to be a narcotics detective. And he remembered me from when I was in narcotics. So that kind of diffused everything. But had I been Joe Citizen... Just me saying to the cop, what is your problem? Could have flipped this whole script. So so when I say ponder what to do and what not to do with an apparently aggressive overreacting police officer, i.e. officer unfriendly, um, that's a good example. Just shut up. Just shut up. No, again, just less is more. All right. You don't need to do any more than you need to do. And you and you really just need to comply. Don't be a wise ass. There are lawyers that tell you, oh, you don't have to do anything. Keep your window up and just hold your drivers. No, don't, don't, don't be an asshole. Okay. Right. Even if that were lawful, even if you could legitimately get away with it, to me, that's like, it's like flag burning, right? You have an absolute first amendment privilege, right? To set the American flag on fire. But if you take a blowtorch to the stars and stripes, if you set old glory ablaze, I got news for you. You are not a patriot. You are an asshole. Especially so, if you do it in the middle of a 4th of July parade with veterans there. Right. Whatever the case. I mean, you, they're just things you don't do. All right. So, look, like, if the like, cop is the expression, you know, you know, the expression that two wrongs don't make a right applies here. If the cop is aggressive, if the cop is off base, if the cop is unhinged, you need to act exactly the opposite so as to not make that worse. Anything that you do to throw fuel on that fire, I got news for you. It may not be right. And at the end of the day, you may be correct, but it ain't going to take away from the beating that you're likely to get. Listen, for example, when you get officer unfriendly, Mr. Officer Unhinged, you may not want to say to him, what's your problem? <laughs> yeah. Or, or under what authority? You know, I mean, you just don't, you, these are things you don't do. Now you bring on yourself. Now it doesn't make it right. No, nope. it doesn't make it lawful. It just makes it what we call reasonably foreseeable. Okay? And, in this, and in this case, a, this man who was finally exonerated, 
who was given $800,000, which to be honest with you, 16 years of my life, that probably wouldn't have been enough. But yet he got 800,000. He had an opportunity to get his life back together. Less than three years later, he's dead over a speeding ticket, a speeding ticket. This, this is the unfortunate reality of how things can go south very quickly. Now I want to reiterate, and, and I really want to make sure the audience understands this because I believe this. I, I, I have been a defense attorney for almost 32 years now. I have done dozens, dozens of ride alongs with police officers in many, many different jurisdictions. Um, I've done always done them on either Friday nights or Saturday nights because I never wanted boring shifts. I mean, I've done from Miami Beach to Hialeah, okay? I've done Marine Patrol. I have, I've, I've really done an awful lot of these things. And until you do that, when you do that, if you do that, you really get a different experience and appreciation for what these men and women on the side of the road are going through. I firmly and wholeheartedly believe that the vast, 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 overwhelming, almost complete supermajority of law enforcement all they want to do is get home to their families after every shift. That's it. They don't want to ruin your life. They don't want to ruin their life. They just want to get home in one piece. So you need to understand that that's a dynamic that you're going to deal with with virtually any cop in virtually any scenario. Most of them are not going to come out of the gate like this guy, aggressive, officer, unfriendly. Most of them are going to come out either neutral or, frankly, friendly and pleasant because they're just there to do their job. If you're speeding, you get a speeding ticket, you get a warning, goodbye and good luck. But if you're going to try and push a cop into the roadway, if you're going to be belligerent and combative and not follow instructions and challenge him and force him to tase you, I mean, maybe not force him, but goad him or bait him into tasing you, um, you know, then, then things, again, are going to get really ugly really fast. So this is the human condition. Know what you're dealing with. I mean, are you going to, when you board the airplane, sometimes the, 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 the pilot's cockpit is open and you can see the pilot sitting there, you know, you usually wave because, you know, everybody wants a friendly pilot. Who's going to go in there and start shit with the pilot? Who's going to walk in the plane and start, hey, you look like a moron. You're going to fly this plane? I, I don't want to get on a plane with you. I mean, really? Why? Why would you do this? So, you, you know, and, and the pilot is not going to beat you with a baton or tase you. <laughs> right. The pilot so, is not armed and he's look, the other thing is this, you gotta understand that these officers get trained. One of their training, and it happens, it, it is actually effective most of the time. Is that when somebody starts getting a little bit belligerent to immediately take control and yell at them and, and intimidate them. That's that believe Right. Me. And if you notice in the video, when this guy when the guy got his hands on the car. And he told him to turn around. So the guy turned his head back. He immediately pulled out his radio and, and called for backup at that point. Right? He said non-cooperative or combative. I don't remember what. Non-cooperative non suspect. Send backup. Because he already knew that things were going south. In his mind, he had already made that calculus. And they're trained to yell and scream and, and intimidate. And, and, you know, that's that's one of their training. So... This officer reverted to his training, but in this case, I think, like you said, it was at ad nauseum. I think he should have come out a little different. And like I always tell my clients, there's always time to fight. You know, if he didn't come out, you're, you know, Michael, you said it earlier. It's possible. It's possible that this sergeant could have come out and said, sir, please step out of the vehicle. And the guy might have come out and said, you know, I'm not doing shit. What the hell is your problem? Who do you think you are? And this officer could have said, sir, you were speeding. I need your license and registration. Or, sir, you were speeding. I need you to do me a favor and come to the back of the vehicle. No, I'm not doing shit, sir. This is going to go one way or the other. But either way, you're going to comply with me. The question is, are you going to do it the easy way or the hard way? And I don't want to do it the hard way. I really that, would rather do it. That would have been, a, that would have, that would have been much better. The last thing that I want to say about this and, and I don't want to get into a controversy about it. I just want to say it. As I watched this, it was a, a, 
a, a, a Caucasian police officer and an African-American subject. I did not see a racial component to this. I did not hear a racial component to it. I did not see or observe a racial component to it. And I would not make this a, uh, a race-based well, issue. From either of them, by the way. From either of them. But um, I will say that the lawyer for the family cannot, uh, cannot say the same, as that is exactly what he has called this. Uh, his quote, and I understand his job is to stir up shit, but his quote was, just because you're black should not be the determining factor whether you get a death sentence from a traffic stop. I don't know so, the officer saw knew he was black when he started yelling at him to get out of the car, but maybe. I don't know. I don't see this. I just want to go on the record and say that I do not see this as a racial incident. I see this as, unfortunately, a, a human condition incident. I see this as an officer who started an interaction with a person who was mentally unstable and, and, and damaged uh, at the hands of, of the criminal justice system, if not police, certainly the system for whom the police or with which the police work. And so in his mind, I could certainly understand where he would be uh, hyper sensitive and hyper concerned and hyper, you know, uh, alert and vigilant. Um, and so the officer's initial action certainly didn't help. But I suspect that even if he had done it the way that you just suggested, which clearly would have been a far better way to do this, and again, he may have still had the, He may have eventually had to have tased him. I, I think it may have. I think it may have gone the same way anyhow. Unfortunately, because again, he was dealing with somebody who honestly was not apparently by the testimony of his own family or the words of his own family. You know, he 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 was easily triggered under these types of circumstances. So, it, it, it unfortunately it may have been all but inevitable in this situation. But I don't believe that it had anything to do with race. No. Um, so look, I, I I hope that we've given the audience a pretty good feel for you know this is this is what I would call an absolute worst case scenario. Um, there's an awful lot of lessons to be learned here. We don't need to rehash them now, but um, if you find yourself in a position where you have to deal with a law enforcement officer, just remember the other Haber PA tagline that I use all the time: uh, the three M's: Mo Motion, Merton, and Murphy. Um, you know. For motion, you've got Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So if you want to go at it with the cops, you can't expect them not to come back and react if you go in it with them. Merton is Professor Robert K. Merton. That's the law of unintended consequences. You may intend X. Like, let's say that, that your only intention in questioning the officer's authority is that you really didn't think you did anything wrong. And so you're, you're asking, but what you can't control is the unintended consequence of how somebody else interprets what you're saying or doing. And then finally, you have Murphy's Law. Murphy is Murphy's Law, which was coined after United States Air Force Captain Edward A. Murphy. Um, and, and, and you all know that, that, that colloquialism that basically says anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And so you, you have that dynamic in this situation, all three of those things. And, and so, uh, you know, you don't want to find yourself there. We don't want to find you there. Uh, your best practice, again, if you have an off, out of control or unhinged officer, dial 911. Don't engage with him. Get another cop on the scene. Make it clear that you are sane, calm, and rational and trying to deal with this like a responsible citizen. And then it's the officer who's out of control. Because I guarantee you, when other officers get dispatched, if this guy is off the hinge, they're going to walk him back. Now they're involved. Their names are now associated with this incident. There's a case number that they're involved in, too. The CAD reports are going to show them there. The GPS tracking is going to show them there. They're not going to want to be associated with a police-involved shooting unless it's a very clean and absolutely necessary shooting. So... You know, there are things that you can do. And and again, you can't control the cop, but you can control you. And your attitude and your behavior and your actions will in large part dictate how this thing goes uh, moving forward. Right. Final thoughts and then let's wrap up. I agree. I agree 100%. I think we've discussed it. Um, it's, it's a horrific tragedy that this man was killed for a speeding ticket. It's just, it's, it's, 
it's sad. And and I got to be honest, it's sad for the officer, too. I mean, let's be honest. It doesn't seem like he was all gung-ho about this. He was crying. He was distraught about it. Um, This is going to affect him for the rest of his life, too. Because Absolutely. At the end of the day, he killed someone over a traffic, a speeding ticket. Someone no, was he's... killed. So the family is going to say, I lost my brother and my son over a speeding ticket. And this man is going to say, I had to kill somebody over a speeding ticket. It's it. This is everybody loses here. There is no winning. This is all degrees of loss. Yep. And it and I don't know if it was avoidable, but again, I think there are certainly things that both people could have done if they were in a different frame of mind or if they had thought it through a little better and not acted with such, you know, aggress aggressive immediate reactions. Again, I think the officer set the tone. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just. I don't know that it would have happened differently, but I, I can't condone the way he got out of the car. That said, he was attacked uh, by a guy who was combative and un, and and not following uh, lawful commands. So, you know, that's a whole different end. And it, it, it it's what I guess we might call, uh, what, what do they call that? And Torch said a superseding intervening factor that breaks the chain of causation, right? So even if the cop started out on the wrong foot, this guy took it to a completely different level. Yeah. Um, uh, but but again, it shouldn't have started that way. That officer should not uh, have, have reacted like that out of the gate. It reminds me of the show that we did with those Scorpion unit guys, the the, the, the African-American officers who took down the African-American guy at the traffic stop. Yeah. In Memphis, Wasn't that Atlanta too? Was. Wasn't I think that it was in Memphis. We did a show on it a, a couple of months ago, and, and they had gotten – there was – body cam and dash cam and you saw the way these guys came out of the car on a traffic stop four of them guns drawn screaming like lunatics and you say to yourself but why you know why do they need to react that way so I, look it does happen but again i say that's the exception to the rule i think most officers are, are not going to approach you that way because they also know based on their experience they're setting the tone right so if they come up to you and they're you know, even if they're just all business and robotic, it's better than if they're aggressive and nasty. Certainly, if they're they're polite and pleasant, that's the best case scenario. But look, we don't live in a in a cream puff marshmallow world full of you know people holding hands and singing kumbaya. Really, uh, we don't. Which is which I guess is fortunate for you and I because we might have to get real jobs otherwise. I thought we did. I thought everybody was just cream with uh, cream puffs and marshmallows and everybody singing kumbaya. Yeah, well, maybe in the next life, my brother. Anyhow, I want to thank everybody for watching the show. I, I appreciate it. Ed appreciates it. We hope that you uh, that you got some good information out of it. Um, you can feel free to, you know, Google this uh, this this uh, 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 incident. You can certainly watch the full twenty minute video. You can read the, the various news reports, um, all of which, by the way, everyone that I read put a racial spin on this incident. Again, it's the only reason I brought up the issue to begin with is because they're bringing it up. I, I don't see it, but uh, feel free to come to your own conclusions. There's no obligation for you to accept either mine or Ed's as, as true and accurate. Although I think they are uh, that said, hopefully we'll see you next week. I don't know, but uh, we'll let you know for episode number 79 of at your service with Haber and Martinez, uh, the good folks at Miami community news uh, papers who produce this show will be uh, uploading it to YouTube and the various social media channels, which we will do is also as soon as they get it done. So thank you guys. Sorry we ran a little bit over today. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your attention. We appreciate your allowing us to be at your service. And you're always welcome to call either Ed or I at any time, should you have any questions, comments, or even criticisms and critiques. We'd be happy to field them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miami Communities Newspapers. And we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Oh, happy Halloween, by the way. Yeah. Be safe. Bye-bye, everyone.